Warner. I am a co-founder of GitHub. How many guys in here and girls use GitHub? Raise your hands. Uh, that's what I like to see. <laughs> yeah, you guys are all right. So I'm giving a talk today about entrepreneurship and how I went from a, an unknown in San Diego to where I am now, which is up here speaking to you about how you can do what I did. So hopefully, you'll be able to get a few pointers from this talk. And if you are on the journey yourself to being an entrepreneur, if you are right now in this place where you're writing Ruby code and you want to be an entrepreneur building your own business, then listen because you might learn a thing or two. So it's common knowledge that if you want to be good at something, you have to put in long hours of practice, many, many hours. People throw around this number of 10,000 hours of practice to become an expert at something. That's great, makes sense, right? But how do you know what it is that you want to be good at? And I think the answer to that is experimentation. In order to know what you want to do, you have to experiment with a lot of different things. Now, 20 years ago, ago, I was growing up in Iowa, a little town on the Mississippi called Dubuque. And my dad was what I called at the time a construction worker. And what the hell does that mean, right? Construction worker. Well, to me as a kid, it meant that he kind of did odd jobs. He would do um, roofing jobs or he would do uh, demolition type jobs. And one of the things that was kind of a perk of this job, of these jobs, was that he got to bring back all kinds of stuff from places that were on fire and that had burned down and he was kind of hauling away all the stuff. So our basement was constantly filled with all manner of things from electric meters to jars full of large capacitors, cabling, you name it, golf clubs, all kinds of stuff. Just whatever he could find that he could bring home and then scav uh, scavenge for metal. He would just resell that. Now, to my parents, that was just piles of junk. But to me, these were magical <coughs> things that I could take apart because they were just junk and nobody cared. So I'd go in there with my screwdriver and, and something to just piece these things apart, open them up and see how they worked. And this was where my journey down experimentation, free experimentation, where nobody says you can't go and do that. A lot of days, you run into things and there's no permission anymore. It's like you can't take apart your iPhone because you'll void the warranty, right? But for me back then, it was all about, let's look inside these things and see what makes them tick. So this attitude of experimentation, where I wasn't gonna let anyone tell me what I couldn't do because I'd grown up with the freedom to do these things, this experimentation mindset followed me through high school and through college, and eventually into the very first company I founded, which was called Cube6 Media. This was originally a three-person team. Uh, I found it in San Diego after I'd been laid off of a previous job doing Java coding. And now, it's maybe a little <coughs> optimistic to call it a company, because really, the other two people that I founded it with kind of bailed out and went and started their own companies. And, and I was left alone to run this company, but that was okay, because it was what I wanted to do. It was what I felt passionate about. And so, really what I was was a freelancer. And I was looking for jobs doing web application coding. But not knowing anyone, not being very well networked in San Diego, it was hard to find clients that I could go to and say, hey, I wanna do this for you and here's my credentials. I didn't have a lot of credentials of stuff I could show people. And I didn't know a lot of people that were well connected. So what I did is I experimented with some other things like graphic design. I did a lot of work for posters and catalogs and brochures. I also experimented with photography. I spent a lot of time building out a nice little photography studio where I could take thousands and thousands of photos of sandals because that was the one photography job that I could reliably get. And so this, yeah, well, you take, you take three or 400 pictures of sandals and you get to know sandals really well. <laughs> so I, I experimented with photography, graphic design, and other things, but 
I would always come back to web application development. That was always my true love, coming from a Java background, doing web applications back at the end of the internet bubble. This is what I wanted to do. And so, at my previous job, I had been writing Java, and one of my good friends, who was working on the front end, his job was writing Cold Fusion for the website itself, and kind of the, the e-commerce thing, and this and that. And we would talk, and he would make fun of me for how long it took me to write something that he could write in just a few lines of Cold Fusion. And this always made me a little bit jealous, because why am I sitting here fighting with abstract container factories when I could just hit MySQL directly and pull the information right out? So at Cube6 Media, I started to experiment with Cold Fusion. Cold Fusion was great for a while until the proprietary nature of it kind of wore down on me and the fact that I was pirating software because it's very expensive to run client sites just didn't sit with me very well. <laughs> and so eventually Cold Fusion, as awesome as it is, just started to lose its luster. But at the time, PHP was starting to come on the scene. And PHP was very much like Cold Fusion in that it allowed you to grab things directly from the database, do iterations really quickly, not have to deal with a lot of ceremony to get simple things done. And it was completely free and ran on top of completely free software like Apache. And it was very well integrated and there was a lot of documentation. And you could get started without any money involved at all. And this is exactly what I needed because I wasn't making a lot of money. So I did that for a while. I did PHP and as many PHP developers did at the time, you started to, to create your own web framework because there weren't a lot of web frameworks out there and eventually you get tired of writing that same form processing code over and over again. And so I was creating a framework which I called Zen with an X, Z-E-N, and I'm really glad I didn't stick with that name because there's something of that name now that is slightly more popular. <laughs> but what I did do is come across another technology, which was really nice and kind of blew my mind, and that was Rails. Sparkle. I had done a little bit of Ruby before I had seen it. I had looked at the block syntax and said, from my PHP and Cold Fusion and Java perspective, what the hell is going on? <laughs> How many of you had that moment where the first time you looked at blocks, you were just Okay, well, you're all smarter than me, apparently. <laughs> but to me, it was very magical. And when I saw Rails, it was exactly what I wanted to do in PHP, already done for me, 10 times better, and it was using Ruby, which I had found intriguing before because it exceeded the scope of PHP. PHP is very much the web layer. And Ruby on Rails and Ruby sit all the way down the stack. Well, you can write anything in, in Ruby, right? You're not constrained to just websites. So I found that very exciting. So I started writing Rails almost immediately once I found it and started doing that for client sites. But it's difficult to learn a framework simultaneous to developing client sites that use that because you make mistakes and then your client gets angry and it just doesn't work out so well. Also, all that other stuff you did back in the day in PHP and Cold Fusion, you're still maintaining. But you don't want to because you're using Rails now. And it's so much better than anything you've used before that to go back and look at those sites that you had done previously in those old languages, it just it hurts inside. You know, when you learn a new technology and then you have to keep using an old technology, it's just it's painful. And so I wanted to escape that. And what I did was I talked to one of my friends, one of the friends who had originally founded Q6 Media with me was working at a company called Helmets to Hard Hats. And they had just hired a full-time Rails developer to do a full rewrite of their web application. Now don't get me started on how terrible an idea complete site rewrites are, but this was an opportunity for me to come in, kind of ditch all that old stuff I was doing and not really making that much money yet anyway, and start afresh at this company doing Rails work. So I kindly told all of my old clients that they were fired, and I took a full-time job at Helmets to Hardhats. And this is where I met one of my best friends, 
over the years, Chris Van Pelt. He now runs and has founded a company called Crowdflower in San Francisco. So he's where I met, uh, at Homestead Hardhouse is where I met Chris. And together we kind of learned Rails and built all kinds of technology and did this horrible database migration from the old site to the new site and learned a lot about the technology, what was possible. I think at the time we were using Rails 0.11-ish. It would have been around that time. So there was still a lot of things moving. Everything was progressing very rapidly. So at this company, uh, I was <coughs> delving deeper into Ruby itself, going past the layer of Rails and down into Ruby land. And I signed up for the Ruby mailing list. And on that Ruby mailing list one day, a guy by the name of Kevin Clark comes on and says, hey, I'm thinking of starting a Ruby users group in San Diego. Are there any other Ruby developers around here that would like to join in? And Chris and I saw this, and we said, hey, that would be cool to go down there. It was down on the UCSD campus. It would be cool to go down there and meet these guys and maybe broaden our horizons as far as the Ruby world goes and see some new stuff, see some new technology, see what is really happening in this community and maybe involve ourselves a little bit more. So we went a couple of times, just kind of sat in the back, you know, scoped it out. And it was really cool. People would go up and they would just demonstrate things they were working on or a library that they found that could do something cool. And this, it really struck me that I wanted to be one of those people that was up there talking about something that they were doing. This idea struck me. And so over the next few weeks, I think Chris was working on another side project of his own where he needed some kind of date, time, entry field. 37 Signals at the time had a calendaring part of uh, Basecamp, I believe, where you could say, um, I have a dinner at 6 p.m. or something, right? 6 p.m., 6 p. dinner, like the, the Google Calendar type entry style. And he said, well, I would like to have a, uh, something like that, but there's no library for Ruby that does this kind of English date parsing. And I said, that's interesting. That's an interesting problem, right? Natural language date time parsing is an interesting problem. And so I went home that day that he had brought it up and I was thinking about it and took out a notepad and a pencil and started jotting down the different kind of date time sequences that you could have, things like tomorrow at four, yesterday, afternoon, three months ago, 6 p.m., whatever, right? Just all of the different iterations of how that could look. And after literally probably 30 days of doing this, after work, every night, I came up with Prime. And I like to think that, it's, that it was on purpose that my talk today started at 420. <laughs> I'm not sure if it was or not, but I like to think that it was because it makes me happier about the world, if that was on purpose. <laughs> so Chronic, how many of you know what Chronic is or have used it? <laughs> That's a little ridiculous. <laughs> because I myself have never used this library. <laughs> this was a project that I thought was interesting, something I wanted to experiment with to see if it was indeed possible for me to do. And so those 30 days went by, and I came up with something. And the reason, the reason that I did this, and the reason I do a lot of the things that I do, is because they're what I like to call bomb tick problems. And this stands for bite off more than you can chew. And it's especially cool that when you say that acronym out loud, you say bomb tick. And this suits the purpose very well because a bomb tick experiment is something that is dangerous on purpose. It is something that you commit to do even without any idea how you're going to do it. So I do this all the time. Uh, I do this with programming projects. I do this with, oh, hey, Tom, do you want to come and do the keynote? at startup school, or not the keynote, but a talk at startup school or a keynote at some conference in God knows where, Russia or something, right? It's like something that you want to do that you feel like you can do it, but you don't know how, but you still say yes. 
Those are the kinds of things that I consider to be bombastic problems, and I try to approach these constantly. Because if it makes you a little scared, if it makes you feel like you might be <coughs> overstepping your boundaries a little bit or pushing what you are able to do, those are the kinds of experiments that maybe they end in disaster and maybe they end in spectacular triumph. But those are the problems that allow you to grow as a person, the kind of things that you're not just going to stumble into them. You have to actively go after those hard problems, dedicate yourself to, to them, and then see if you can actually pull it off. So, Chronic, I wrote it about a month. I put out an initial release, the 01 release, and I went back to the San Diego Ruby Users Group, and I gave a 45-minute talk on it, where half of the things that I attempted to do broke, but that's okay. If you go back to that URL that was on that SDRB slide, I'll go there real quick for you. If you go to, to this URL, you'll see four or five talks that I did over the course of a few months, five years ago. So if you want a good laugh, go watch some of those. And you'll see the one about Chronic. So I wrote Chronic. I went to San Diego Ruby Users Group. And I did something that we at GitHub today are very fond of, which is to ship it. And we have a special little image that we use in Campfire when we want to tell someone else that they should ship it. It's called the Ship It Squirrel. And you yourself can benefit from this by grabbing the image at this URL. <laughs> now, the Ship It Squirrel doesn't necessarily mean go and do it right now, but it means this looks awesome. Take it to the next step. And so that's what Chronic was about for me. It was build something, see if it works, get it out there in front of people so that I could become, instead of being a lurker at the back of the, the conference room at UCSD, instead of being back there just watching, I wanted to be up front telling people about what I was doing. And so that was the step, to write a Ruby gem. And so here's another interesting question. How many people in here have written and released a Ruby gem? That's awesome, that's awesome. Writing a Ruby gem, this is how you learn. This is one really great way to get your stuff out in the open, and especially open source stuff, and see what's going on. If you haven't yet written a Ruby gem, I would definitely recommend that you start thinking today, right now, about some problem that would be suitable to be solved by a Ruby gem. Go figure out how to write it, write it, and release it, because it is such a good learning experience, and such a great stepping stone from where you are just watching to someone who's in there participating and producing something new to the world. So if you don't have a Ruby gem released, figure out how to release one and make that your next project. So in the title of this talk, I sort of promised that I would talk about Ruby hacking and how that's relevant to entrepreneurship. And for me, Ruby is so good for entrepreneurs because it allows you to test your experiments very rapidly. In no other language I can think of can you have an idea, implement it so fast as you can in Ruby. So when you are thinking of things for a Ruby gem to create, for instance, you can go from no code to working code that maybe other people are using in a matter of just days sometimes. And that's the kind of power that lets you explore a wide swath of potential accomplishment very quickly. And this is important. Spreading yourself out through a bunch of experiments to find that one experiment that really hits it. If you're lucky, that might be right away. If you're not so lucky, the night might take a little bit longer. But over the, next, over the, over the past four or five years, I've written all of these Ruby gems. I am primary author or maintainer on each one of these gems. And this is how I explore the universe of what is possible. Some of these things, like God, a lot of people say shouldn't even exist. <laughs> I just let that one sink in for a second. But really, a lot of people say to me, all you ever do is re-implement stuff that already exists. They say, not invented here syndrome, etc. But when you look at some of these projects from the perspective that I'm just trying to do something that is already a common need, 
but just in a different way, in a slightly different per perceived way, like a different approach to these problems. This is how all the good things come to exist. I can almost guarantee that everything that you're using today in life was at one time seen as some kind of duplication. Say, oh, why does Apple need to create a better laptop? There's already existing ones that solve that problem. But they do it in a slightly different way. And that way ends up being a lot better sometimes. I can see by looking around that a lot of you agree. So don't worry too much about duplicating an existing problem if you have a different angle on it. A different angle is what's going to take a good idea and make it a great idea. So I'm in San Diego still. And you might remember the two names that I brought up. Kevin Clark. <laughs> I have to do that again. Uh, it's, like, it's like flames, flaming head circles. I don't know. I, I, it, I amuse myself sometimes. Kevin Clark <laughs> and Chris Van Pelt, and you can see me just to the left of Chris. These are the two guys that I met and became really good friends with in San Diego, but this picture isn't taken in San Diego. This picture is at the Power Set office in San Francisco. So here's another step on my journey from that Ruby hacker who didn't know anyone <coughs> to San Francisco running GitHub. This was a very important step. Power set was a uh, Wikipedia search, very, very hyped, maybe overhyped, I'm not sure. But it was a great place to work, and it got me to San Francisco. So the deal was, I knew these guys from San Diego, and they had both moved up to work at Power set. And they kept badgering me to come up and do an interview, and I said, well, I can't because I have a life here, I own a house, um, my whole, you know, I have a job, but everything is, is set, I can't just leave and move up there, that would be a huge ordeal. But eventually I had the opportunity to go up to San Francisco on a different matter, which was to talk to the automatic guys about a potential acquisition of Gravatar, which is another project that I did back in the day. And so I was already going to be in San Francisco, and I said, okay, I'll come by the PowerSet office and see what you guys are doing, and maybe you know, we just talk and, and whatever. No, no commitment to anything, no interview, nothing like that. So I went up there, I had my meeting with Automatic. They didn't go for it at that time, they went for it later on. But I was in San Francisco and I stopped by the Power Set office and they showed me the technology. Kevin was in there and a few other people and they were showing me this stuff and it was legitimately exciting. And my wife was with me, Teresa, who's here in the audience. And after that demo, I was, I was kind of excited. And so the next day, we were scheduled to go back to uh, San Diego. And we went to the airport, we were at the airport, and we're sitting there, and we were trying to, to decide whether it would make sense to go take that interview at PowerSet. Because we went up there and it was a Sunday, and the next day was a Monday, and that would, the, the interview would have to be on that Monday. But we were supposed to fly out that afternoon. So we were at the airport, and we decided, what the hell, let's reschedule that flight back to San Diego, and I'm gonna go to this interview, and we'll just see what happens. We'll just see what happens, right? What's the worst that could happen? You know, let's just, let's check it out. So we get a hotel for the night, and go back the next morning, and I go through a grueling, like, eight-hour interview <laughs> at Bower Set. They were serious about their interviews. But it went pretty well, and everything, okay, went back to San Diego, and a few weeks later got an offer to join our team. And now this is really interesting because at the time, our living room looked like this. We were in the middle of a giant remodel. <laughs> Okay, I will describe this to you. It's not as cool in, in words. But this is our living room, which has one entire wall completely gone, down to the studs, and just basically disaster everywhere. So we were in the middle of this giant reconstruction of the living room that we were doing ourselves. This is another one of those bomb tick problems, kind of literally, 
where it's, oh, hey, let's remodel our entire house. I've never done this before. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> and in this next picture, you can see that when you take out walls, you discover that there is electric stuff in those walls. <laughs> in any case, that's another story. But our house was in a shambles. And the question was, well, do, do we take this job? Do we move it to San Francisco? How are we going to deal with this house? How we can't sell it like this? It's, you know, it's a wreck. And over the next 30 days, we decided to see if we could finish up the remodel. And so about 30 days later, I'm working every night, literally sometimes in 11 at night with a tile saw out on the driveway. We took that big mess and we turned it into something that we could actually appreciate. So this is, this is not only just a part of the story, but this is another lesson in what you can accomplish when you don't know what you can't accomplish. So always think about that. When something seems too big to overcome, I say go for it anyway. Because the worst that can happen is maybe you won't do it, but the best thing that can happen is that you'll have done it, and then you'll get to show people funny photographs during talks. <laughs> so we finished that up, and we move to San Francisco. And San Francisco is a special place. There's no other place in the world that I can think of that you can go to lunch and just randomly be sitting next to people who are talking about optimizing C compilers. <laughs> and this is what makes it special. There's a great quote from Mark Zuckerberg at startup school where he said, he was asked the question, why do you think startups should go to Silicon Valley? Or what is special about Silicon Valley? And he said, San Francisco and Silicon Valley is like instant startup mix. Everything that you need to do a startup is in San Francisco and the Bay Area. Everything is specialized for the mindset of creating a business from scratch. Everything from the incorporation papers and documents, the lawyers that know how to create startup structures the way that they need to be in order for you to give out options and create a, the kind of company that is going to be something that investors can invest in. You've got all of the talent available in that area. All of these things line up and all you have to do is add a good idea and you can get a company rolling really fast. And that's what makes San Francisco special. But not only that, but you've got a place that you can go mountain biking and grow really killer mustaches. <laughs> I really wish you guys could see these in their in their full glory. <laughs> this is me with a with a kicking with a kicking Fu Manchu, like you've never seen before. And another thing, another little piece of advice is when you're stuck on one of these really hard problems, when you feel like maybe you did bite off more than you could chew for real, go out and get some exercise. Because for me, going out and doing a mountain bike ride, getting a little adrenaline going, getting the heart rate up. It's so good at clearing the mind and opening up your creative flow again to tackle those problems. Just stepping away from the problem, go do some exercise, go get out in nature. It really recharges you in a way that, that nothing else I can think of accomplishes. So give that a chance next time you're stuck on something. Go out and exercise. San Francisco is great for that. Now you might be thinking, okay, well, San Francisco sounds great and all, but how do I get there? How do I do what you did. This, you know, it's not like I can just get a job there. Well, maybe you can, because we have this thing on GitHub now called GitHub Jobs. <laughs> I'm just shamelessly plugging all of my stuff here. And if you go to this site, jobs.github.com, you will see that not only are there a ton of jobs here for many of them Ruby developers, but 40 out of those 137 jobs that are on the site right now are in San Francisco. <laughs> There is a huge necessity for talent in San Francisco right now. And I'm saying this a little bit selfishly because we ourselves benefit from drawing a lot of technical talent to San Francisco. But if you are serious about going down an entrepreneurial path, you can do it anywhere. Don't get me wrong. You can start a business from anywhere in the world. But you can't start a business anywhere nearly as easily as you can in San Francisco. So I'm in San Francisco, power set doing my thing, doing Ruby tools on the back end. It's a cool gig, I'm learning a lot. 
I'm hanging out with awesome Ruby developers, still learning Ruby down to the very low levels of metaprogramming and all this. But it's not really what I want long term. What I really want is to start my own business, to run my own thing my own way. And how do I do that? I ask myself, how do I go from working at a startup to creating a startup and do it without having to put myself in a large amount of jeopardy by quitting? Because I've got bills to pay, I've got that mortgage I'm still paying back in San Diego, etc. right? How does this happen? There's a really great book that just came out by a guy named Steven Johnson called Where Good Ideas Come From. And he has this really great quote in it. He says, chance favors the connected mind. And this is kind of the thesis of the whole book, which is ideas, good ideas, don't just come from one place or one person or one point in time. They sort of aggregate over time by many ideas bumping together and transferring that little piece that was missing. So a lot of ideas start as one notion, and as you go out and talk to people, you'll get a little piece that you were missing. You have a hunch for years and years, and then all of a sudden, you're at a conference, and you meet someone who says something that's vaguely related to that, that just tricks something in your mind, and it solidifies what takes your hunch and turns it into an idea that is great and actionable. This is what he talks about. So what are a couple of ways to do this, to make this happen? To get these ideas that are going to be the foundation of something that can become a business. So here's a couple. One of them is to write down everything that frustrates you. And I'm sure you've been frustrated by a dozen things just today. If you start write, writing down everything that you think could do better, a lot of those things are things that people will pay for. And maybe the way you write them down isn't the way that you build them and get people to pay for them, but if you compile this list of ideas, maybe you just do it in your head, that's fine. But if you start thinking about those things, you grow a base of ideas, of concepts, that you can have for later when someone says something or expresses that same problem just in a slightly different way, and maybe the way they express it is all of a sudden monetizable. So write down the things that frustrate you. Those are the kinds of things that you can build, build a business out of. For us, GitHub came out of the frustration that sharing Git repositories on the internet was a huge pain in the ass. And in fact, that was our tagline for the first year or so. Git hosting. No longer a pain in the ass. It said that on the website. <laughs> <coughs> so pick a problem that you have and kind of iterate on it, see where it goes. A nice way to do that, extend those ideas, is to start reading books. And I think this, the Kindle, is one of the greatest things to ever happen to literature. Now, I don't have one of these. I have one of these. And I've read probably 12 books on this thing, on my phone. Because I can do it anywhere, when I'm in line, on an airplane, in the bathroom, why not? You know you do it. <laughs> <laughs> but you can go through so much collected knowledge in books so quickly. Books, a book is so much better than, than blogs, too. Stop reading so much stuff online and start reading books, because those are the people that really take time to express their ideas well. You can find some good stuff online, but for me, reading books is far superior. And now I'm going to sound like a hypocrite, but you should also blog. <laughs> but I'm actually not a hypocrite because blogging isn't about other people. It's about yourself. There's something really magical that happens when you start putting ideas onto paper. You have one concept in your mind, and it seems so clear, but then you start writing about it, and you wonder what the hell you were thinking because it no longer makes any sense the way that you put it on paper. And so writing things makes you really crystallize the concept that's in your mind. And once you have that crystallization, once you have an, a really good grasp on what you think, then you can start taking those ideas that are well thought out and combining them with other ideas. This is something that we did all the time at a Ruby meetup in San Francisco called I Can't Has Ruby. This came out of a dissatisfaction of the existing Ruby meetup. 
and a group of us said, well, we're going to go do our own meetup that we don't invite the VCs to. That was mainly the problem. Like the VCs would come and just try to hire people, and and we would, and that kind of ruined the the feeling of the meetup. So we started our own. And there's a lesson here too. While I did not particularly start this meetup, I found over the last several years, being in a leadership role, leadership really is just about inviting people to do things. All it takes for people to do something is an invitation to do so. If you go out there and you start suggesting things, solutions to problems, ideas that you have for something, or just with your buddies to say, hey, next weekend, let's go to Tahoe and go skiing. If you put those ideas out there, if you take that leadership role, all it takes is just a suggestion, just an invitation. And I think that's kind of blown my mind because it's that simple, really. A lot of the times, being a leader really is just about suggesting something that isn't too stupid for other people to not follow you in doing it. So give that a try next time. Something isn't going the way that you want, just jump in and just make something happen. It's not gonna work every time, but it works well enough that I think it'll really change things depending on your situation. So I came as Ruby. We go to these meetups, and this was the traditional meetup kind of thing where it was an hour or two of talks, and then we would go to a bar afterwards. And these are the kinds of meetings where you can meet people that are enough outside the scope of what you normally do that you get ideas that can really help your idea, that can really complement what you're already thinking about. Because if you just talk to your friends all the time, they're already going to have the same ideas as you. They're going to be too close. That network is too close. You need to go to a broader network to start meeting the people that are going to provide the ideas and the connections that you need to create those really good ideas. And this happened at ICANN as Ruby. This is where the ideas for GitHub started. And in fact, GitHub was born at a bar. This bar right here. Zeke's in San Francisco. This is where I went to Chris Wanstra. And I said, hey, I'm thinking about doing something with a Ruby library that allows me to read Git repositories off disk and then create a site that makes it so people can share them. And he said, that sounds awesome. Because he had been thinking about those kinds of things too, but not in quite the same way. And the idea that I had for sharing repositories hit the ideas that he had for making those kinds of things easier, the process of open source easier. Those ideas came together and we were able to create GitHub out of it. That's the power of going to meetups and drinking with your buddies, just connecting those ideas. Drinking isn't about drinking, it's about sharing ideas. So here's my two co-founders. These are guys that I met at meetups and drinking. And here's where we go back to Ruby. Once you have those people, once you have those connections and those ideas made, you go back to Ruby, you can make those ideas a reality in a few weeks, we went from no code at all for GitHub to a private beta where we started inviting our friends in three months of working evenings and weekends. That's all it took, three months. Three months we took building that initial private release. Six months to the public launch. Six months until we started charging for GitHub. So you can take those ideas and with Ruby, turn them into a reality much faster than you think you can. And the speed with which you can do that means that you can try a lot of things if one of them doesn't work. And that's the key here. And once you do have those things, you can assemble a team of people and continue that collaborative idea making. This is how we do things at GitHub. We don't have individual desks. We have large tables kind of mimicking the coffee house experience. When we got an office, we took everything that we liked about coffee houses and removed everything that we didn't like. Really what we wanted was a place that we could go and hang out together and not have to buy crappy coffee. <laughs> and get to play whatever music we want. That's what we wanted, and so that's what we created in our office. And this is a great way for ideas to spread too, because when you're sitting across from someone and an idea strikes you, you just talk to them directly. If they're not there in your presence, sometimes those ideas just get lost. They just, oof, gone. Linus Pauling said one time that the best way to have good ideas is to have a lot of ideas. 
And implicit in that message is the admission that not all of our, not all of our ideas are going to be good ones. And that's okay. Because if you let your ideas collide with other people's ideas, and you use something like Ruby to implement those ideas quickly, you can go from concept to completion fast enough to try out enough things that it's inevitable that you'll eventually have something successful. <laughs> Thank you.